reach out and touch the Lord as He passes by. You'll find He's not too busy to hear your cry. He's passing by this moment, your needs to stop. Tonight, let's take our Bibles and turn in the Old Testament to the book of Nehemiah, Nehemiah chapter 9. Amen. Nehemiah is uh, just before Esther, and that's just before Job, and Nehemiah is right after Ezra. Mm -hmm. Chapter 9, Remembering God's Blessings. If you're with us for our study last week, you thought, wait, Jerry, we covered chapter 9 last week. We talked about it in terms of the power of God's Word, and tonight we're going to reconsider it and take more time looking at chapter 9 about the blessings that God had given Israel and make application for the blessings which God wants to give to our lives as well. Nehemiah chapter 9, Remembering God's Blessings. And uh, let's bow our hearts before the Lord. Hallelujah. Father, we just thank you and praise you. Father, we think of the Old Testament scriptures and how important they are to our life. We ask, Lord, tonight as we read Nehemiah 9, that, Lord, we would understand what you want us to know tonight. As the people confess their sins, as we look to your word and remember your blessings, we ask that you help us to repent of our sins, to remember your blessings and to walk in them. We ask you to bless all those who will be hearing in the future. Speak to each one of our hearts tonight, Father. We need you. We need new manna. We love you, Father. Amen. Amen and amen. I'm going back to chapter 8 and getting a little background because it's the seventh month, which would be this time of year, mm. actually, about this week. Isn't that interesting and, that uh, that's where we are? I'm going to have Kelly begin to read... Uh, when the seventh month came, the children of Israel were in their cities. And now chapter 8 of Nehemiah, verse 1. Now all the people gathered together as one man in the open square that was in front of the water gate. And they told Ezra, the scribe, to bring the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had commanded Israel. So Ezra, the priest, brought the law before the assembly of men and women and all who could hear with understanding on the first day of the seventh month. Then he read from it in the open square that was in front of the water gate, from morning until midday, before the men and women and those who could understand. And the ears of all the people were attentive to the book of the law. So Ezra the scribe stood on a platform of wood, which they had made for the purpose, and beside him at his right hand stood Ma uh, Mattatiah, Shammah, Ananiah, Uriah, Hilkiah, and Maiah, and at his left hand, Pediah, Mishael, Malachi, Hasham, Hashbadana, Zechariah, and Meshulam. So here we find the reading of the word is going on from literally the break of the day, the dawn. Six o'clock in the morning, 6.30 in the morning, and they're reading the word right up until midday, which would be around noontime. Talk about a long service. And the people were hearing that. They were standing. And we're going to see here the way that the Bible was taught in those days. Not the way we do it today with topical studies and political diatribe and what have you. But simply reading the word and having people explain it. That's all. Just read it and explain it so that people would understand the word. You're going to see the powerful effect that it had. Because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the... Word of God. Word of God. Not yelling and screaming by preachers and what have you, but by the word of God itself. And so he had people on the right hand and the left who would explain it as he read it, even as Kelly and I do in our ministry here. It's called expository teaching uh, or verse-by-verse -verse teaching. And so verse uh, 5, Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, for he was standing above all the people, and when he opened it, all the people stood up. So now we go out with verse 6, honey. 
And Ezra blessed the people, the great God. Let's read that again. Yeah. And Ezra blessed the Lord, <laughs> the great God. Then all the people answered, Amen, Amen, while lifting up their hands. And they bowed their heads and worshiped the Lord with their faces to the ground. And so then we have these people who were helping in verse 7. We don't, uh, let's not bother with all the names. But they helped the people to understand the law. And the people stood in their place. That was the kind of Bible teaching they did then. Read it and explain it. That's all. Just read it and explain it. And so they read distinctly from the book. Read that distinctly, carefully, so they understood in the law of God, and they gave the sense. Notice they're reading it distinctly, and they're giving the sense. They're explaining what God is saying. And they helped them to understand the reading. Verse 8, to me, is the essence of the verse-by-verse -verse teaching. Read that again, honey. Read again. So they read distinctly from the book in the law of God, and they gave the sense and helped them to understand the reading. So he went on to uh, explain this is a, a great day. Go to your families now, take the food and the drink, and celebrate. And because they understood the word, they now understood something which had not be done, had been done since they had entered the land of Israel. In all those years, they had not done this, and now they understood from the Bible. Have you noticed when you get into the Bible, there are things you never knew about? Your priest didn't tell you about it, the rabbi didn't tell you about it, the pastor didn't tell you, but it's in the book of the Bible. And so folks who've read the book know things that God intends for them. So on the second day, verse 13, let's read that, honey. Now on the second day, the heads of the father's houses of all the people with the priests and Levites were gathered to Ezra, the scribe, in order to understand the words of the law. And they found written in the law, which the Lord had commanded by Moses, that the children of Israel should dwell in booths during mm. the feast of the seventh month. and that they should announce and proclaim in all their cities and in Jerusalem, saying, Go out to the mountain and bring olive branches, branches of oil trees, myrtle branches, palm branches, and branches of leafy trees, to make booths, as it is written. Then the people went out and brought them and made themselves booths, each one on the roof of his house, or in the car courtyards, or the courts of the house of God, and in the open square of the water gate, and in the open square of the gate of Ephraim. So the whole assembly of those who had returned from the captivity made booths and sat under the booths, for since the day of Joshua, the son of Nun, until that day the children of Israel had not done so, and there was very great gladness." Also, day by day, from the first day until the last day, he read from the book of the law of God. And they kept the feast seven days. And on the eighth day, there was a sacred assembly, according to the prescribed manner. So they followed the word of God. The word of God had shown them to make booths. And this comes from Leviticus. Why booths? as a remembrance of how God kept them safe in the wilderness. Through those 40 years of the wilderness, he protected them, and they were to celebrate this by getting leafy branches, and they were to uh, put them in their backyard or on their, their patio or what have you, and they were to eat in that booth structure for the seven days and invite guests if they uh, had any who stopped by. And uh, this is something they hadn't done since they came into the land. Wow. That's about a thousand years they hadn't done it. King David didn't do it. Solomon didn't do it. They didn't do those booths. How many have ever seen booths of your Jewish neighbors? Have you ever seen them? What time of year do they do that? Watch this. I'm going to talk to my girlfriend. My <laughs> wife doesn't mind. <laughs> when is Sukkot? I didn't get that. Try <laughs> tapping above to edit. When is Sukkot? Sukkot started on this Tuesday and ends on Monday. So my girlfriend knows it started last Tuesday and it ends on Monday. You're in it right now. I could have told you our neighbors have it. I called Kelly today because I hadn't seen if the neighbors had it. Our backyard neighbors have their booth up. What they do is they have a patio and they have poles and they have curtains that you can't see there and they erect it. Uh, and then they have the, the kids come out and uh, have dinner with them. And uh, they're remembering how God provided for them during the wilderness time. 
Uh, so it's, a, it's an idea of his provision, of his peace. They're doing it right now, at this very week. And it's going to go on until next Monday, according to Siri. And she's right. So I always wanted you to get that. They have uh, the smartest children. Oh, they do. They oh my do. gosh, I love those little kids. They had no computers until they had um, uh, COVID and quarantine. And now the computers are rigged only for studies, and piano he- lessons, violin lessons. And Hebrew. Hebrew, Jewish households. They'll become doctors, lawyers, Indian chiefs, God bless them. <laughs> but may they come to know Yeshua. And so um, I, my wife, in honor of that, is wearing her Shema. Show them the Shema. And uh, if we understood the Hebrew, we would understand this is Deuteronomy 6.4. And uh, I talked to my Jewish salesman who told me this. It starts here and works around here. But I don't know the letters myself. But uh, in English, it's Hero Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And every Jewish child learns that, memorizes that. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. We talked about this last week. Let's do it again. The word Shema means here. So Shema, here. Shema Israel. Shema Israel. That's hear, O Israel. Shema Israel Adonai. Adonai. That's the Lord. Shema Israel Adonai Eloheinu. Eloheinu. Our God. Shema Israel Adonai Eloheinu. Adonai, Adonai. The Lord, Echod, Echod is one. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Shema Israel, Adonai, Eloheinu, Echod. The word Echod, one, is a compound word, not a singular. It's a compound, two or more. And so that word indicates that God is at least in two persons or more in their own language. We know it to be three persons, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. If it were not so, it would be Shema Israel, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Yaqid. But it's Echod, it's compound unity. And so here God is indicating to them, you erect these booths and you, you remember what I have done for you. Now for the Christian, Jesus Christ becomes our shelter. He's the one who keeps us safe. He's the one who's going to make provision for us in this life and also in the millennium hereafter and Israel in the millennium hereafter. So that's the background. Now the people understood in the reading of the word they were to celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles or I, I talked to Sue, I asked her about that. She doesn't know Feast of Tabernacles. Siri is, a, uh, is truly Jewish and she says Sukkot, S-U-K-K-O-T which means booths, same thing. All right. Now, they have been understanding the word, and look at chapter 9 now, as they let the word convict them and they confess their sins. Let's begin with Nehemiah chapter 9, verse 1. Now, on the 24th day of this month, the children of Israel were assembled with fasting, in sackcloth and with dust on their heads. Then those of Israelite lineage separated themselves from all foreigners, and they stood and confessed their sins and the iniquities of their fathers. That is a part of reading God's word. When you say faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, also confession, knowledge of sin, of repentance comes through the word of God. We would not know we were sinners apart from the word of God, the law of God. Just like the mirror reveals changes you have to make in your appearance. So the word of God shows you changes to make in your life. And so they stood in their place, verse 3. And they stood up in their place and read from the book of the law on the Lord, of the Lord their God, for one-fourth of the day. One-fourth? How many hours are there in a day? Twenty-four. What's one-fourth of that? Six hours? So they read from one-fourth of the day. They read the word for six hours. For another fourth, they confessed and worshiped the Lord their God. That's another six hours. Okay, so they honey, had a 12-hour shift. Yeah, we're going to go to church, honey. It's 6 o'clock in the morning, be home at 6 o'clock at night. And we complain because the service is an hour and a half. <laughs> Hallelujah. Well, now that they have confessed their sins, they've done what God told them to do about celebrating Sukkot or Feast of Tabernacles or booths, now it's time to praise the Lord. And that's the theme of tonight's message, remembering God's blessings. We love testimonies here. My mother insisted when we started this church, always give testimonies of what God has done. Remember what the Lord has done. It glorifies him. It edifies others. It edifies ourselves. And and then uh, if you look in the Old Testament, God is always telling them to remember. 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 What I've done. Remember. You know why? I know why. 
be like me because I forget things. And we all forget things. And we happen to forget the good things. Do you ever do you remember that? Sure. Right? I always tell my students when I teach them, teaching, I teach nursing, first, uh, first class in nursing, and I always say, now you're going to hear mostly bad stories. And they're like, bad stories? I'm like, yeah, because I remember all the bad stories. But you know what? God wants us to remember the good things. Yeah. So we have COVID-19 still with us, and we have Delta variants, and on and on and on. Is God going to protect us? Well, let's see. Did he ever protect me before? How about a year ago? Did he protect you from this, from that? How about when you were young? How about you think back about your past and let that build your faith for the present? So let's read uh, Good. verse 5. Good point. Uh, Levites, uh, and the hero of the names, they said what? Stand up and bless the Lord your God forever and ever. Blessed be your glorious name, which is exalted above all blessing and praise. You alone are the Lord. You have made heaven the heaven of heavens with all their host, the earth and everything on it, the seas and all that is in them, and you preserve them all. The host of heaven worships you. So in this praise we're getting perspective. You don't just jump into your problem. Oh, I got COVID, I got fear, I got to lose my job. If you start off in your prayer life and praise life with the problem, the problem is huge. And God is very small in your thinking. Oh, start Lord. off with God and how great he is. And the more you build up God, the smaller that problem becomes. Give us this day our daily bread, Jesus said. No, he didn't quite start that way, did he? Our Father. Our Father who, who art in heaven, heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Then give us this day our daily bread. So when you're going to talk about COVID or something else, start off about how great God is. You made the heavens, the earth, the seas, and everything in them. You know all things. You stand outside of time. You're awesome. You heal. You're awesome. Now we got this situation going here, Lord, and you know how to handle it. So maybe you'll get so much into the praise and awesomeness of God that you'll almost forget to bring the petition. To how them. many of you guys are praying for COVID to be dispersed? Is it too big for God? No. And that's why I added, we added on the prayer list a bunch of um, scriptures so we could, you know, someone will see them, they'll, they'll get in the hurry and they'll start reading the scriptures, and then they'll start praying. We want to tell God how great he is, and start praying against this COVID thing. Start praying that it gets exposed. Start praying we get delivered from all of this craziness. God knows what he's doing. He's great. The Lord gave this to me the he can other do day. It. I heard the expression, follow the science, and I'm not getting into politics and into medicine and what have you. Kelly's more into the medicine area than I am. But we hear follow the science, and I'm not disputing that. And they're all following the science and they're looking for FDA and C CDC and all that kind of stuff. And the Lord said, how about telling them to follow the true science? Genesis 1, verse 1. In Here's the beginning. The science. In the beginning, God created He's the, the scientist. heavens and the earth. That's the science. Follow the science. So what you do about vaccines and what you do about procedures and what have you, go to God. He created your body. Ask him what to do. And then you follow him. That's my, that's my lesson on science. That's all I know about I it. I love it. And uh, <laughs> that's why I was an English major in college. Forget the rest of science. All right, let's go on to how great God is. And let's talk about what he did. What did he do? Let's go back to Father Abraham, beginning in verse 7. Father We're Abraham. In, uh, you know that song? Yeah, I do. Love Nehemiah that song. Nehemiah chapter 9. Let's talk about how God blessed Abraham, verses 5 through 8. Oh, wait, I'm sorry. Uh, let's look at uh, verses 7 and 8 here. You are the Lord God who chose Abraham and brought him out of Ur of the Chaldeans and gave him the name Abraham. You found his heart faithful before you and made a covenant with him to give the land of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perserites, the Jebusites, and the Girgashites, to give it to his descendants. You have performed your words, for you are righteous. Now, they're writing this about 440 BC. We're now in uh, 2021. That's uh, a lot later. And look at how Abraham's promise from God is still in existence. God uh, changed his name to father of many nations. 
Instead of exalted father, it was father of many. And so he is of all who are of faith, uh, Jew and Gentile. Uh, verse 8, look, you found his heart faithful before you. That's interesting. Abraham is the father of faith. If I am critical of him, I could say, but weren't you the one that allowed your wife didn't you give your wife to sleep the, with to the, the pharaoh because you were afraid your head would be cut off? And didn't you listen to your wife and decide to enter the maid Hagar and have Ishmael instead of waiting for the promise of Isaac by Sarah? And we have problems today over in the, the West Bank and the Gaza Strip and all kinds of headaches over there because of you, Abraham? And God would say, shut up. I don't see it. I see his faith. I don't see his mistakes. Isn't that good? I see his faith. And Jerry, you've got your mistakes, and you've made a mess of things, but you have faith in my son, and I see your faith. And you'll be in the Hall of Fame, Jerry, not because of a life without sin and without mistakes, but because of a life cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. So he is the father of faith. Don't point out somebody's faults. It'll lead them to Jesus. The devil likes and to do that. That's right. Then the Lord's going to cleanse them. Oh, he them. came to the Lord. He found his heart faithful. Or he was, he's walking with the Lord and he made that mistake or she made that mistake or they did that sin. Do you know if they repented? Don't worry about it. So he found his heart faithful. He made a promise to him. He promised that they would get the land, the land in which they are right now. Amen. And give it to the descendants. This was the land that belonged to the Canaanites when they first arrived. There were Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Jebusites. Those were the dwellers in Jerusalem. The Girgashites. They were all Gentiles and gave it to his descendants, the Jews. Do you know any Hittites today? Do you know any Amorites or Perizzites? No. Do you know any Jews? Do you know anybody in Israel? The only nation ever to exist outside its promised land for all those thousands of years, several thousand years. He still is righteous. You have performed your words, for you are righteous. Say that to yourself every day. God, you have performed your words. He looks to you perform his are, word, you know he that? Does. He's looking for somebody to believe in him. He loves to perform Sometimes his I word. use that in prayer. I say, Lord, your word says you're looking to perform your word. That's right. He's, He's looking, looking for the So are we taking the word to him? Lord, your word says this, this can be done then. Right. Because I know right here it says, you look to perform your word. That's right. Give him his word. Tell him what he said. He loves to hear it. Lord, you promised in your word that this would be done. Amen. So now that's about what he did with Abraham. Abraham is the father of faith. Jerry is a man of faith. Kelly is a woman of faith because of our faith in Jesus Christ. And you put your own name in there as well. Now verse 9 he goes on to talk now about the Exodus and how God was faithful and blessed them in the Exodus when they came out of bondage in Egypt. Verses 9 through 12. You saw the affliction of our fathers in Egypt and heard their cry by the Red Sea. You showed signs and wonders against Pharaoh, against all his servants, and against all the people of his land. For you knew that they acted proudly against them. So you made a name for yourself as it is this day. And you divided the sea before them, so that they went through the midst of the sea and the dry land, and their persecutors you threw into the deep, as a stone into the mighty waters. Moreover, you led them by day with a cloudy pillar, and by night with a pillar of fire, to give them light on the road which they should travel. So look at the blessings that God gave in the Exodus, and see about this today. Is God able to handle COVID? Maybe COVID's too big for him. Maybe that's the one thing in all the world he cannot handle. I think we act like that sometimes. Totally afraid. Totally in fear. Totally overwhelmed by that. Well, I'm going to tell you something. Spend less time listening to the news and more time getting into the good news of God's word. Verse 9, he says, You saw the affliction of our fathers in Egypt. God saw how they suffered in Egypt because of the bondage under Pharaoh. He heard their cry by the Red Sea. They were crying, they were afraid, and uh, you showed signs and wonders against Pharaoh. And the sun, remember that? They had the magicians and they were doing the counterfeit Oh, signs. yes. Oh, so Satan can do a lot of, uh, of uh, counterfeiting, uh, except when it comes to creating. You look at those miracles that were performed and uh, the ones that were creative in, in nature, uh, the, the, the uh, uh, magicians could not duplicate. God cannot, Satan cannot create. All he can do is duplicate. Ah, he's a copycat. He's a copycat. 
Well, they acted proudly, he says. So you made a name for yourself as it is this day. God made a name for himself as the deliverer. Amen. And you divided the sea before them. What an awesome task. Which is harder, to stop COVID or to part the Red Sea? It's all the same to God. The Red Sea. It's all the same to God. He can can do it all. He parted the Red Sea. They're persecutors who uh, you, you threw into the deep as a stone into the mighty waters. Moreover, and I love this part in verse 12. Let's read that again. Yes. Moreover, you led them by day with a cloudy pillar and by night with a pillar of fire to give them light on the road which they should travel. So you know the story. They're out there in the wilderness. And uh, the wilderness, they, they need to know where God wants them to go. And here they are, about two or three million Jews, and they're in tents, and they're looking for direction. And so the Lord manifests himself in a pillar Amen. of cloud by Manifested daytime. Manifested in light. And uh, they would look at that cloud, and they would stay Thank where they Lord. were until the cloud moved. Yes, when the cloud moved, starting with the tribe of Judah, they had to pack up their belongings and follow that cloud through the wilderness until it stopped. Amen. It, it might, they might sit there for a day, a month, a year, but they watched that cloud. When the cloud moved, they moved. That cloud stood over the tabernacle representing the throne of God. Jesus becomes our cloud. He will come back on clouds in great glory. Keep your eyes on the cloud. Should I stay Thank in you, New York? You, Should I stay in California? Should I move? Should I do this? Should I do that? Keep your eye on him. I, He'll show I you. Should I wear a mask? Should I not? Do I get the vaccine? Do I not get a vaccine here? Follow the cloud. Keep it simple. People get into all kinds of things about science, and I'm not saying don't get into the news or alternate news. My mother was very simple. I followed her. I just say to Jesus, what do I do about a mask here? What do I do about the vaccine? What do I do about food? And I uh, had dinner tonight with Rick and Veronica, and uh, I thought all day what I want to have. And the, the Lord just said, listen to him, because this guy knows more about food and nutrition and health. <laughs> and I love what you ordered for us. It, it was amazing. Magnificent. And so I just simply say, follow the cloud. Well, the cloud is great during the day, but what do you do at night? Kind of hard to see a cloud at night, isn't it? Don't you know that God knew that? My people can't see a cloud during the night. Did he have an idea? Or was he stumped? Hey, I'll take that cloud and I'll turn it into a pillar of fire by night. So they, number one, they can see it. Number two, they can stay warm by it because it gets cold in the desert at night. Veronica's in the desert four days a week. And you She's really there, in the you desert. there at the nighttime and it does get cold, doesn't it? It does get cold at night. And so that pillar of, of fire keeps you warm. And then thirdly, when the uh, enemies come, it kept the enemies away. Yeah. So the all protection there. Amen. So God had that. So my point is, you know, follow the science. Follow the science of Genesis 1-1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Keep your eyes on Jesus. Keep your eyes on the cloud. You'll never go wrong. All right, now verse 13 through 15, God blessed them by giving the law to Moses. You came down also on Mount Sinai and spoke with them from heaven and gave them just ordinances and true laws, good statutes and commandments. You made known to them your holy Sabbath and commanded them precepts, statutes, and laws by the hand of Moses, your servant. You gave them bread from heaven for their hunger and brought them water out of the rock for their thirst and told them to go and to possess the land which you had sworn to give them. So on Mount Sinai, as they were getting prepared to, uh, to have their journey through the wilderness, and it's down in the Sinai Peninsula today, as you know, uh, he spoke with them from heaven through Moses and gave them just ordinances and true laws. We have that, of course, in the book of uh, Leviticus. Mm-hmm. And uh, in Deuteronomy, it's repeated. It's called the second law. And they were good statutes and they were good commandments. And they apply today. They're good commandments for us to follow. You made known to them your holy Sabbath. That's the day of rest. They were to show their faith by trusting God that if they took that seventh day off, which was Saturday, that they would not do their customary work, their regular job, but God would provide for them. And they would be able to uh, rest that day and worship him and put their focus in on him and their trust on him. And Hebrews tells us in chapter 7, Jesus becomes our Sabbath. So for Christians, we celebrate the Sabbath by looking to and trusting in Jesus Christ. They celebrated it on Saturday. We do it every day, all day. Watch the cloud, 
observe the Sabbath, trust in Jesus. And so he commanded those precepts and statutes. And by the hand of Moses, your servant, you gave them bread. Remember the manna from heaven? Mm -hmm. Jesus said what? I am the bread of, of life. life. You feed upon him. He feeds you spiritually. And then he brought water out of the rock. Remember they were thirsty? Mm -hmm. And uh, he said to Moses, just, he said, uh, strike that rock. And uh, we talked about this tonight at dinner with Veronica about how sad it was that poor Moses mm -hmm. could not enter the promised land. And with those rebellious Jews for 40 years, putting up with them, he couldn't set one sacred foot on that sacred ground. Why? Because the first time they needed water, God said to take your rod and strike the rock. He did, and water came out of that rock. And Paul says that rock represented Jesus, who quenches our thirst. The problem with Moses was years later, when he was irritated with them, the Lord said that to this time, speak to the rock, mm. not strike it, speak to the rock. Moses didn't. He was angry with the people. He took his rod and he struck it, not once, but twice. Water did come out, but God did say because of that, your disobedience, you disobeyed me and you misrepresented me before the people. And to whom much is given, much is expected. Because of your being a leader like that, you're not going to go into the promised land. Tough, but a good lesson for all of us. He gave bread, he gave water, and then he said to them, go in to possess the land which you had sworn to give them. Now there's a sermon in there someplace, honey. Told them to go in to possess the land which you had promised and sworn to give them. That's for the Jews, and they are never going to possess that land completely until Jesus Christ returns. And they're fighting over the West Bank and the Gaza, and I'm not going to get into that whole political thing. But you know the land that God has for them when Jesus comes? Much further towards Egypt than the Sinai Peninsula. It's going to go way down to the Wadi, the river that separates Egypt from the Sinai Peninsula. Way on up past Israel, past Syria, past Iraq, way up to the Euphrates River. They, they couldn't even imagine that. They got, that's what's going to happen with Jesus. When, when you possess the land of Jesus, you can't believe that God has such wonderful things for you. What is the land you have for Jerry? Lord, what is my mission? You remember how Jabez in Genesis said, Lord, increase my borders? For all of you, think about what is the land that God wants you to possess? What is your ministry? What is your area that, you, that God's going to serve you in? Are you fully able to possess the land that you get? Now here's another lesson when you get into the possessing of the land. It goes little by little, battle by battle, because it was too great for them to get all at once. I want all my blessings all at once. I couldn't handle it. I've got to have a blessing by blessing by blessing. That's right. But Lord, am I doing all I can do for you today? Am I supposed to do more? And so ask the Lord to show you what is the land you're supposed to possess and then give you the strength to go in and claim it in his name. He told them to go in to possess the land which he had sworn to give them. Sworn to give them. Hmm. And so it takes time. All right, verse 16 now talks about uh, the years in the wilderness. But they and our fathers acted proudly, hardened their necks, and did not heed your commandments. They refused to obey, and they were not mindful of your wonders that, they, that you did among them. <laughs> but they hardened their necks, and in their rebellion they appointed a leader to return to their bondage. But you are God, ready to pardon, gracious and merciful, slow to anger, abundant in kindness, and did not forsake them. That was a sad situation, wasn't it? Here's Moses up there fasting 40 days and 40 nights. And he comes down with the Ten Commandments. And what are they doing? They're having a party. And they seduced his older brother, uh, Aaron, to make them a golden calf. And... Uh, they said, this is the God who led us out of Egypt. And so they began to uh, get unhappy. He said, let's go take the, the land of Canaan. They walked in there and said, there are giants there. We can't take that land. And so what did they do? They began to uh, be afraid. Mm -hmm. And they wanted to stone Moses, wanted to stone Aaron. And uh, so God could have washed his hands. He could have totally washed his hands of them. But he forgave them. We said that Abraham made a serious mistake by entering Hagar and having Ishmael, by, by letting his wife be put into the harem of the, of the king. 
of the, uh, the Pharaoh so that she could be had by somebody else. The mistakes that I've made, the mistakes that you've made. But I want you to read this doesn't wonderful this, part. Doesn't this, doesn't this remind you of us? Exactly. But <laughs> he says, but you are God. Look at this. Read this again, honey. You are but God. you are God, ready to pardon, gracious and merciful, slow to anger, abundant in kindness, and did not forsake them. That's God. You've done things that were wrong. So have I. You ask God to forgive them. Come to Jesus Christ. Let his cleansing blood wash away your sins and repent the way they did here. Confess their sins. Remember, confession is simply saying the same thing that God says. But that doesn't save you. Unless you repent, you'll be perishing. So confession means, I agree, Lord, what I did was wrong. But repentance says, I'm going to turn away. I'm not going to do it again. And so here they, God, you're ready to pardon. You're gracious. You're merciful. You're slow to anger. You're abundant in kindness. You didn't forsake them. He didn't forsake Abraham. He's not going to forsake you or me. So, verse 18. Even when they made a molded calf for themselves and said, this is your God that brought you up out of Egypt and worked great provocations, yet in your manifold mercies, you did not forsake them in the wilderness. The pillar of the cloud did not depart from them by day to lead them on the road, nor the pillar of fire by night to show them light and the way they should go. You also gave your good spirit to instruct them and did not withhold your manna from their mouth and gave them water for their thirst. Forty years you sustained them in the wilderness. They lacked nothing. Their clothes did not wear out and their feet did not swell. There's God's grace. There's his wilderness experience with them, kind of like the wilderness we have right now in our lives. Uh, even though we are in Christ, this life is a wilderness in many ways. And so uh, there's a temptation. Look at verse 18. They looked at that golden calf and uh, they uh, thought this is the God who had led them out of Egypt. Well, there are golden calves around there today. There's the golden calf of public opinion, the golden calf of your political party, golden calf of your, your priest, your rabbi, your pastor, of your denomination, of the uh, news channel that you read. Uh, these become our golden calves. Idolatry. Camps. Are you going to follow them or are you going to follow the Lord? Are you going to listen to the Lord or are you going to listen to them? That's right. And my teacher Chuck Smith used to say that every other book that you read requires rose-colored glasses to filter out that which is not true. Wow. This is the only book you can read First of all, without rose-colored glasses, without a filter. And it's the only book you cannot understand apart from the author, God himself. If he opens your mind, you're going to understand it. And so he says here that he gave you, uh, that, that this false God did not lead you out. So don't go to the false gods of today. And I'm not talking politics one party or the other. I said the other day, and I believe that. God's not a Democrat or a Republican. As a matter of fact, he didn't really even want this form of government at all. What form did he want? Theocracy. Theocracy. He wanted to be the king. But the people in Samuel said, no, make us a king like the people around us. And oh, we want to have our constitution. We want to have our republic and all. Fine. Great. Well, they wanted a king. And I'll, I'll still work through, I'll work through your officials, but it's not my best. They got so for one. you and for me, we do follow our, our, our established government, but in our hearts, in our hearts, we follow the not king. Not me. You follow the king. All right, in your manifold mercies, verse 19, you didn't forsake them in the wilderness. That pillar of the cloud did not depart from them by day. Well, I can't feel the Lord. I can't see the Lord. I don't know where I am. Nonsense. He's there. Draw near to him. Maybe, He'll draw near to well, you. Well, maybe they should spend some time with him that's right. in their prayer closet. I never met anybody. That's a good point, honey. I never met a person say, I can't hear from God. And when I said, are you reading the Bible every day? They said, yes. Are you praying? No. They're not praying. They're not reading the Word of God. They're not getting brothers and sisters to pray for them. They're not coming to church. They're not paying their tithes. Well, I can't hear from God. Well, you're not looking for Him. And they couldn't see the pillar of cloud in those days unless they opened their eyes, got out of their tents, opened their eyes, and looked to see where that cloud was. And you and I must do the same thing and as well. And also, if you want to hear from God, you want, and you want, you know, I, I know some people right now that need to hear from God. So, you know what you need to do? You need to go to a prayer group. You need to go to church. That's right. You need to uh, be present in a Bible study. You need to go submit 
into a church under a, under a pastor. Yeah, and you also need to, Malachi, you know, do your uh, proper things for giving. And all those things, God will rebuke the devourer for your sake, and you will learn. You have to sit under other people. Yeah, you have to hum sometimes humble yourself under other people. You have to sit in prayer groups and praise and go to church. You can't just sit home and always think that, you know, unless you're studying the Word of God and you're really being faithful at home and doing what's right, most people aren't. There's some that do, but a lot aren't, and they're not growing in the Lord, or you're not seeing the blessings, or I'm not hearing from God. Well, you know, I, I can't get a job, or I have this problem with this, or I don't have, I ha, you know, I don't have any friends. I, and I get that. I totally get it. But you got to start with God. Ask him what you're supposed to do, and then begin to obey him. That's right. Look for that pillar of cloud. And um, I follow the Lord from 7 in the morning until 7 at night, and then I forget about him from 7 at night until 7 in the morning. How many of us don't think about the Lord, don't read the word at night, don't pay attention to the Lord? We just goof off and do our own thing. Watch the pillar of fire by night. He might move them out in the evening. So God speaks to you at night. We talked about uh, reading the Proverbs or reading a psalm before you go to bed. Get your mind on the Lord. You're going to sleep well if you do that. In any event, we're going to just about draft, uh, wrap this up here. Honey, do you um, know, can I just say something? Yeah. Do you know I used to not sleep very well? How do I sleep? With four dogs in the bed, uh, like, a, like a lamb. <laughs> Truly. I, but years ago, I went to my pastor and I told him, I said, I can't sleep. It was a big problem. Couldn't sleep. Couldn't sleep only a couple hours. I'm like, do I need to get on some kind of sleeping pill or something? He said, no, you need to read the Psalms before you go to bed. So I started reading the Psalms. And honestly, when I wake up, I swear to you, I don't even know I'm awake sometimes. I sleep so good. And verse 20 says, you gave your good spirit to instruct them. Why not say to the Holy Spirit, you're good? Amen. Holy Spirit, you're good, and I appreciate you, and uh, you are to be instructed, and tell someone about the Holy Spirit, mm -hmm. and you did not withhold your manna from their mouth, and you gave them water for their thirst, and oh, they complained constantly, didn't they? Oh, they yammered and complained. Yammering is a Yiddish term for complaining. Forty years you sustained them in the wilderness. They lacked nothing. Wow. Their wah, clothes, wah. clothes didn't wear out, their feet didn't swell. 40 years. 40 years in the he wilderness? Yep. What did they put on their feet? The sandals. The sandals just didn't have to be resold. So that's it. We're gonna, we didn't quite finish this. We must have had good with. Italian feet, for on, uh, <laughs> uh, shoes, Veronica. <laughs> good uh, Italian shoes, for sure. So that's the early part of this, uh, remembering God's blessings. We're going to leave them in the wilderness here. If we come back next week, they'll still be there. Don't you worry about it. Uh, meanwhile, you are in the middle of Sukkot, or Feast of Tabernacles. So... It started, we said, Tuesday. Siri told me it started Tuesday and ends next, uh, next Monday. It's the, the Feast of Booths. Jesus Christ becomes your booth. He becomes the one who gives you shelter and protection. And all this experience in the wilderness is celebrated by those booths. The protection, the food, the, the, the drink, and uh, safety from their enemies. All of that because of Jesus Christ. Amen. Remember God's blessings. Honey, close us in prayer, would you? Oh, yes. Father, we thank you so much. Thank you for this wonderful word tonight about remembering your blessings. Help us to look back and remember. Help us to remember what good things you've done for us. Help us to learn from the bad and not to let it happen again. Father, we pray even now as we're going through this struggle in the world, raise up your people, mighty, mighty men and women, Lord, who love you. Raise them up. Help them to remember and help them to be brave. Help us to be thankful. We ask these things in your name. Amen. Amen and amen. He's passing by this moment, your needs to supply.